In this lesson, we're going to explore the mechanism of fructose bisphosphate aldolase, or aldolase for short. To begin, we need to review a few key organic reactions. The first is iminium ion formation. In this reaction, an aldehyde or ketone reacts with a primary or secondary amine, in this example, dimethylamine, typically in the presence of weak acid, to give an aminium ion. The amine attacks this protonated carbonyl, so the carbonyl can react with some of the acid, forming a bond, and then dehydration occurs, so we'll lose water in this reaction, and form the aminium ion. The second reaction we need to review is the aldol condensation. Here we have two ketones, and we can react these in the presence of acid or base, under acidic conditions, we'll form an enol from one of these reactants, and under basic conditions, we'll form an enolate. Let's use the base catalyzed example and show the enolate that will form. This enolate can then attack the unreacted ketone, and following a protonation step, we'll get a hydroxy ketone. These often eliminate spontaneously or with a little bit of warming of the solution to give enones. This reaction is reversible, and there is a reverse of this reaction that'll actually go in this direction, cleaving the bond right here, and that's called the retroaldol. We'll begin from the hydroxy ketone, and if we treat this with base, we'll get some deprotonation of this alcohol. The alkoxide that we make can push these electrons back down, promoting the cleavage of this bond here. The arrow pushing looks like this, and if we follow our arrows, we'll produce an enolate and a ketone. So we're showing this enolate forming from this bond breaking and these electrons pushing up, and these electrons pushing back down give our ketone. You're probably less familiar with the retroaldol than the aldol reaction. The aldol reaction is quite common, but the retroaldol is pretty rare. It's actually really hard to cleave carbon-carbon bonds, even forming an enolate like this. But what if we were somehow able to combine these two reactions? Well, what would happen? Aldolase does just this. So let's take a look. If we combine these reactions, we'll start still from our hydroxy ketone. Now, imagine we form an aminium ion from this carbonyl. Now, when we deprotonate this hydroxyl, and I'm going to abbreviate a base uh, just using the letter B with some electrons on it, our arrow pushing will look like this. We can deprotonate, reform the carbonyl, break this bond, and neutralize a positive charge on nitrogen instead of producing a negative charge on oxygen. That's much more favorable. This enamine here can be converted back to an aminium ion, and since this reaction was reversible, we can get back to a ketone. Okay, getting back to aldolase, let's take a look at the overall reaction that this enzyme catalyzes. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is going to be cleaved into two 3-carbon compounds, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, or DHAP, and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which we'll call G3P. I'm going to abbreviate the phosphate group. So in our mechanism, we'll abbreviate this. Anywhere that the phosphate group is hanging off of the organic molecule, we'll show this. Now you may have noticed that this doesn't look anything like these hydroxy ketone compounds that we're talking about doing retroaldols. This is the closed chain form of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. The reaction actually occurs on the open chain form. So if we envision a base coming in and deprotonating here, these electrons can push in and open the ring. And now with the enzyme stabilizing the open form of this compound, we can see we have our carbonyl, just like we have here. Skip this carbon and then one away, we have an OH group. So we can do this type of reaction. This reaction, of course, occurs within the active site of an enzyme, so I'm representing that with this pink line. 
there's actually an active site lysine residue that's going to be our amine and is going to react with our ketone here. Now I'm going to draw in a couple of enzyme residues that we're not going to define, but we're going to use to help us draw our mechanism easily. Here's a generic basic amino acid residue that can accept a proton. And over here, I'm adding an amino acid residue that will act as a proton donor. Lysine is often charged, but in order to have a pair of electrons to attack this carbonyl, it needs to be deprotonated. So I've just represented it in that form. This basic enzyme residue is going to take off another proton, and these electrons that are left behind will attack our carbonyl. So we'll deprotonate lysine as it attacks. We don't want to make five bonds to carbon, so we're going to cleave the carbonyl, and as the carbonyl opens up, it can grab a proton from the proton donor amino acid residue. Now we have this enzyme bound intermediate, bound in a covalent bond. The next step is a minium ion formation. The lone pair on this nitrogen will push in and we'll show this OH grabbing a proton from a proton donor on the enzyme on its way out. I've added in a proton donor, so the lone pair on nitrogen is going to form a double bond. The OH group is going to leave as water, grabbing that proton off of our enzyme. Now with our aminium ion formed, like we had up here, we can show the retroaldol step. In aldolase, it's an aspartate residue that comes in and deprotonates here. So when I'm not sure of the residues, I use this shorthand for proton acceptors and proton donors, but in this case, we know the actual amino acid, so I'm drawing out its side chain. So in this reaction up here, aspartate is this base. We can show it taking off the proton. These electrons will push in to make a carbonyl, and I'm just going to mark the bond that cleaves with this little dotted line here. So the electrons making that bond will push up and we can neutralize the positive charge on the aminium ion. First, let's draw everything that's left on the enzyme. So when we cleave this bond, we put a double bond here, and that's reflected here. We now have our single bond to nitrogen since it's got its electrons back, and we have that here. And now let's draw what we form from this piece. So the aspartate took off this proton, we formed a double bond here, so this is our, our aldehyde comes from this carbon here, and the rest of these pieces are the same. And this corresponds to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So we've made one of our products, and the other product is still bound to the enzyme, so we need to get it off of there. First, I do want to show you that this has resonance. If we push the lone pair on nitrogen again so that we make a double bond, we can show these electrons move on to carbon, giving us an anion on that carbon. Now remember, we protonated this aspartate residue here. Let's draw that back in in its protonated form. The protonated side chain can provide the proton to react with this anion. Now we have an aminium ion, just like we had up here. And remember, I mentioned that aminium ions can reverse forming ketones again. And that's how we're going to form DHAP. To begin that process, we now need to add in a molecule of water. Here's our water, and I've added in a generic basic amino acid residue that can accept a proton here so that these electrons can form a bond. Now all that's left to do is form a double bond here, kick off the lysine side chain so it's available to catalyze another reaction, and we're going to do that using basic and acidic enzyme residues again. Our proton acceptor deprotonates the OH, the carbonyl reforms, and the lysine side chain grabs a proton as it cleaves off of our DHAP molecule and our lysine residue is now free and available to bond to another molecule of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, promoting this reaction again and again.